Hi everyone, let's talk about leadership. Heavenly Father, thank you for the ability, the opportunity, and the privilege to talk together today. Guide us in this intersection between your calling our, and our inability to sometimes connect and sometimes understand why it is that you called us. Allow us to be intentional about our health, our physical health, our spiritual health, and our mental health in Jesus' name. Amen. For the first 10 years of my marriage, I was a great pastor, very effective at what I did, but a terrible husband. I didn't beat my wife. There was no physical abuse. There were no affairs, but I was not present. I was not present with my kids. I was not present with my spouse. I was available to everybody but the people that loved me the most. And at a certain point in my professional and spiritual leadership life, I realized that you find yourself sometimes in this intersection between what God called you to be and what you think you can fulfill. And at some point, when you're working on your own energy, when you're working on your own strength, when you're working on your own ideas, when you're working on your own reserves, you start understanding that you, it's on, you, you're you unable to fulfill the calling that God asks you to do. You, you're unable to do exactly what God called you to do. And I want to talk to you today about this uh, this intersection. And I want to give you um, some clear and understandable tips and ideas for your leadership as you lead the people of God, whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, uh, and I'm going to divide my message today into two parts. Number one, I'm going to talk about something Dr. John Townsend calls relational deficit. Relational deficit. And then I'm going to talk to you about Five ways that relational deficit affects your leadership. So if you're caught, caught in a place where you're like, man, I know God called me to this, but I just can't give anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have the strength. I don't have the ideas. I'm, I'm burning out. I, I'm having issues with the people that I love the most. See, I, when I die, I want the people that love me the most to, this, to respect me the most. I, I want the people closest to me to love me. Uh, and, and not everybody respect me because of what I do and what I write and what I present. But the people close to me are like, well, he, he was a good leader over there. But over here, he was not present. He was, he was not other-centered in his own family. So let's, let's get to it. I'm going to help you today. And if you have, a, uh, you have the chat, you can make comments. You can ask questions. You can reach out to me. I have a, I have a YouTube channel. Um, you can go to Pastor Roger Hernandez, and I have a lot of leadership stuff there, lots of stuff on how to be a YouTuber, how to write your book, uh, a lot of leadership con concepts. If you go there, it can help you, all right? So I'm, I'm here to help you reach out. Anything that I can do to help you, um, I am willing to do. So let's talk about relational deficit. The concept of relational deficit by John Townsend is that everybody has these seven relationships in their life. Some of them make deposits into you. Some of them make withdrawals. And if you are not careful as a leader, you can find yourself in a space where you always find yourself in relationships that only make withdrawals, not relationships that make deposits. If you're not careful, you always are pouring into somebody, but nobody is pouring into you. You're helping other people, but nobody's helping you. You're blessing other people, but nobody is blessing you. So let's go through these seven relationships, and I want you to take a self-test, self-analysis. I want you to look, be introspective for a moment and tell yourself and ask yourself whether this is you and whether you have these seven relationships and whether your relationships are balanced where your emotional balance sheet is not in the red.
All right, we ready? Okay, let's go. Number one, you have somebody in your life or you should have somebody in your life that is a coach. A coach is somebody who is already where you want to go. That is a mentor. That is somebody, if you want to be a millionaire, I'm not going to ask for financial advice from my friend who always forgets his wallet when we go out to eat. I'm going to ask for financial advice to somebody who's a millionaire, right? If I want to become a millionaire, I want to ask somebody who's already become a millionaire, who's already experienced financial success. A coach in the religious space, in the spiritual space, is somebody who's already been effective for a period of time. I want my friends for support, but not for counsel. I want the counsel from somebody who's already achieved where I want to go. If I want to be a writer, I want to be coached by somebody who's written some books that people already have have actually read. If, if I want to be a pastor, I want to be a good preacher, I want to talk to somebody who communicates effectively. If, if, I, if I want to be a good elder, uh, if I want to be a good deaconess, if I want to be a good Sabbath school superintendent, whatever role I'm doing in the church, I need people to coach me. The people who say they don't need a coach are people who are caught up in themselves. This is a narcissistic problem, right? I've met people along the way, along my ministry. I have met people who don't think they need anybody to coach them. They don't want anybody to coach them. They, I already know. Those are the three, three la famous last words of a leader. I already know. I've already known. I've already done this. I've already led this way. I've already had this position before. What When you don't go to somebody for coaching, right? when you don't have mentors in your life, what it reveals is deep-seated insecurities, right? Because only insecure leaders resist coaching because they might reveal that you actually don't know that much or as much as you think you know. Even if you've been an elder for 20 years, we are in unprecedented times. So I need to have conversations with people who've gone through unprecedented times before. I need to find out especially if I'm in this virtual space. So what is working for churches in the virtual space? Who's doing it right? Who has been doing it right? Who's connecting well? Who's seen during this pandemic their attendance increase, churches like that, their tithe and offerings increase, right? The connection with people increase, their baptisms increase. During the pandemic, there are churches like that. I need coaches in my life. The longer you are, in leadership, the harder it is to find a good coach. But that's not an excuse not to find a good coach. Even if you ha can't have a personal relationship with a coach, you need to read people who know more than you. You need to listen to people who know more than you. You need to watch YouTube videos for people who know more than you. Not, not a shameless plug, by the way. Just <laughs> I'm talking about other people. You need to look online. You need to connect with in the virtual space and listen to, I congratulate you, as you have uh, joined this uh, conference, I congratulate you because it is by listening that we learn. Coach. Number two is comrades. Comrades are people who are your friends. These are the people that you've grown up with. These are people that you can't, you don't have to talk to them for like a month. And in a month you talk to them, it's like as if you had talked to them yesterday. These are your your the con people that you connect with. These are the people that love you and you love them. These are the people that pour into you, that know who you are and love you anyway. These are the people that are excited about your projects. These are the people that clap when you win. These are the people that are amazed when you have a new idea. These people are not jealous of you. They're not in competition with you. These are people that love what you're doing and love to hear about your successes. These are people that are your cheering squad. These are people that love what God is doing in your life. You need some friends in your life like that. You want to know who a friend is? Look around you and when you win. Whoever's clapping, that's your friend. A friend rejoices when you get married and they haven't. A friend rejoices when you write your book and they haven't. A friend rejoices when you get that preaching gig and they haven't. A, fr a friend rejoices when you get ahead and in finances, and they haven't. A friend rejoices for you when there's things that come in your life, even if they think they deserved it, but you got it. 
they rejoice anyway. Those are true friends. Those are hard to find but are necessary. The coaches make deposits. The comrades make deposits. Number three, casuals. Casuals are people that connect with you in a casual relationship. They make investments into your life on a non-regular basis. Let me give you an example in my own personal life. My wife and I, we are empty nesters. So on Sundays, we used to go out with our kids and have activities with them. But now that they're not at the house, I have I found myself with my Sundays open. And I looked at my Sundays and I'm like, what am I going to do on Sundays? And I remember that I used to play baseball when I was a teenager, when a young adult, even into my 30s, I played baseball. It's my first love, my first passion. And I said, I'm going to go, go back and play baseball now. And there's a league in my town. It's not a church league where they have fights. You know you know how church leagues are. It's, a, it's an old people league. Everybody who plays has to be 50 years or older. 50 years or older. I am 53. I'm the youngest in my team. I'm like the spring chicken. They're like, man, you're so fast. I'm not fast. <laughs> But to them, right, most of them are 60, 65. We have a 70-year-old that plays in our team. We do it for fun. It's not competitive. Nobody gets upset. Everybody pulls a hand. <laughs> There's at least one person who pulls a hammy every weekend. Everybody is, it's, it's a fun time. We play double headers on Sunday, and we're excited about coming and playing and, 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 and you know, getting out of the house. These are my casuals, right? They don't call me Pastor Roger. Right? They don't call me reverend. They don't call me, uh, they don't ask me um, biblical questions. We've had biblical conversations, spiritual conversations, but every conversation is not a spiritual conversation, right? I'm just Roger to them. I go and play baseball, and some of them might cuss sometimes, and they're like, oh, excuse me, Pastor, excuse me, Red, and, and catch themselves. But these are normal people. None of them are Adventists. None of them. Come to my church. It, they're my casual. I go there to distress. I can let my hair down. Uh, singular. I can let my hair down. I can, can just go and play baseball for a Sunday morning with no expectations. I don't have to put a facade, right? Because you know, Pastor, sometimes you have you've had a little. Uh, you, I'm talking to elders too. I'm talking to church people right now. You, you had you. All of us have had a diff, uh, 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 an argument with our spouse going to church on Saturday morning, and and you have to <laughs> you you haven't resolved it yet, and you're upset at each other. But you have you, you walk in church and you're like, yeah, no. oh hello, hi, how are you? How's everybody doing today? Oh, and God has inspired us today to sing this hymn. See, you have you have to you have to do a little pretending. Everybody's done it, right? Everybody's done it at some point, right? Because you want to fix this stuff with your spouse later on. But for now, you have to make sure you have to pretend everything is fine because you're not not going to be fighting in front of people. Uh, but but with casuals, I don't have I don't have to pretend. I don't have to go in there and, and have spiritual to speak. I I can just I can just I can love them. I can talk about whatever there there is going on in their life. They, it's interesting that these, these normal people have asked me spiritual questions. They've talked to me about prophecy and the end of the world. And why is it that I don't play baseball on Saturdays and I only play on Sundays? Because sometimes we might have a makeup game on Saturday. My casuals, they pour into me, right? These are making deposits. The coaches make deposits. The comrades make deposits. The casuals make deposits. The colleagues can go either way, right? We're now in the middle of the seven. This is number four. The colleagues can go either way. You have colleagues who make deposits, right? Who work where you work and you eat lunch with them at your job. The casuals are people that you enjoy with. If you're a pastor, you enjoy hanging out with them at workers' meeting. If you're an elder, it's one of, it's one of the elders that you and him or you and her uh, you go shopping, go fishing, uh, uh, go to the store together, have a picnic, uh, go to each other's houses. The colleagues um, can go either way, though, because you also have some colleagues that you don't want to see. There are some colleagues that you wish 
were not working there anymore, or you were not working there anymore. There are some colleagues that are having conversations with your boss to put you uh, and make you look in a bad light. There are some colleagues that that you <laughs> that you, uh, you you're like, man, this person, I get, I oh, it's Monday morning. I'm gonna see so and so. I'm gonna talk to so and so. Colleagues can go either way. They can make deposits or they can make withdrawals. Now, the last three are the withdrawal category. The last three. Uh, the number five is care. Everybody, if you're a leader, you have somebody under your care. If you're a parent, you have children under your care. If you're a spouse, you have your wife or your husband that's under your care. If you have a mother or a father who's older and you're taking care of them, they might fall into this category. There are people in your congregation that look to you for leadership, for advice, for what to do. They are under your care. If you're an elder, if you're, if you're a department director, they look to you. If you have a position in the church, even if it's just a simple position in the church, you are a leader. You have people under your care. If you're a pastor, that would be your congregation, right? If you're a boss at your job, you have people under you that you care for. This is usually a one-way relationship. Most of the time, your fulfillment comes into seeing them grow. But it's pretty much a one-way relationship. There's very little reverse mentoring here because you're teaching them. You are their mentor. You are their coach, right? If you get a coach, you're not, you're not in that relationship to give something to the coach. You're there to receive something. So now you, in this relationship, now you become the coach. You see why it's so necessary for you to have a coach? Because you're a coach to somebody. So how can you teach people? How can you help people if you are not being coached by anybody else? These people in your care is a one-way relationship. They take from you everything you can give them. And if you don't put boundaries, they won't know when to stop. They won't by themselves say, yeah, that's enough. I shouldn't call my pastor at 8 o'clock at night. That's enough. I'm not going to ask any more questions. I'm not going to bother them. I'm not going to uh, hit them up for advice. Right? You have to put boundaries. Here's the problem, though. As helpers and as spiritual leaders, we see the growth in people, and we are invested in their success. So sometimes we feel that we have to fix everybody, that we have to change everybody. And sometimes we see actual change in people, and we're like, man, I need to invest a lot more time with this person because I see what they're doing. So it's interesting that this care can drain you. Even though you have good intentions, if you're not careful about replenishing, right? If you have a bank account and you're spending, 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 even though you're investing, right? You're investing, 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 but nothing's coming in. Eventually, you're going to run out of money to invest. Same things happens relationally. Same things happens with your spiritual, emotional tank, right? These are people who are care. You have to put boundaries. Number six, what uh, Dr. Townsend calls them the chronics. What are chronics? And what's the difference between chronics and care? Care, when you talk to them and you help them, you see change. Chronics, you do not. Chronics are people, in the South, we, we have a phrase for them. We call them bless their heart people. They have asked you the same question every month since you've known them. Hey, what do you think about, what do you think I should do to have a better relationship with my spouse? What do you think I should do? Uh, because we're fighting too much. And every time you talk to them, it's about the same thing. They fight about the same thing. They're having issues about the same thing. They're having problems about the same thing. It's crazy, right? And you tell them, listen, when you're mad at each other, don't start, don't start talking right there. Give yourself a little bit of time, right? Don't start yelling at each other in front of the kids. You promise not to yell in front of the kids? Yeah, pastor, we promise. Yeah, elder, we promise. Yeah, friend, we promise. And then they come back next week. Yeah, we yelled in front of the kids again. We couldn't stop each other. 
These are people that you tell them, don't spend any money on Black Friday. You're already in debt. And they're say like, okay, we understand. And then you see the social media pictures with them. Hey, hello. Social, yeah, Black Friday. Yo, what's up, yo? It's crazy. These are the chronics. These are really depleting because you're depleted, not just because you're giving them of your energy, right? You're giving them of your counsel, but you're depleted because no matter what you do, you can't fix them. And all of us as leaders, we have this little thing in the back of our mind saying, if they only gave me more time, if they only gave me a little bit more uh, opportunity, I can fix this person. There's some of you who think it's your job to fix other people. And, and you have to understand as a leader, you're not a savior. Those of us that want to be messiahs end up crucified. You have to understand you are not people's messiahs. You are people's mentors, but not messiahs. You chronic people will drain you. And you get so frustrated because you're saying to yourself, man, I've told them five times. And they don't listen. They don't listen. But then you go back again next week with the same counsel. And you listen to the same thing again. It's frustrating. It's draining. You start not answering your phone calls, not responding to the text, avoiding them at church so they don't catch you in a corner. Because you know when they catch you in a corner, that's it. You can't greet anybody else. They won't let you go. Chronics. And then the last one is the worst one. That's contaminants. Contaminants are people in your life who they hate you, they don't like you, they've never liked you, and they're never going to like you. Uh, they are praying for your demise. They are right now thinking of ways to hurt you. These are people that for some reason have a grudge against you. It might be that they're jealous about your success. It might be that they just like you as a person. It might be usually that they're toxic themselves. So they want to hurt you. Once again, we spend a lot of emotional energy that could very well be spent into people that actually need our help and to try to change contaminants' minds. It's not, your, it's not my job to change how you feel about me. You're going to feel how you feel about me. It's my job to treat you kindly, to treat, to treat you with a Christian attitude to, to treat you like Jesus would treat you. But it's not my job to change your mind. It's my job to live out my God-ordained purpose. And sometimes new levels bring out new devils. And when you're trying to work for God and as a leader, and we have some measure of success, some people hate you just because you're successful. It doesn't matter. You, there's nothing wrong with you. They just hate the fact that you have success And they compare what their life is to what your life is. And they are completely enraged by your success. You might have had differences of opinion with somebody. You have, might have had some strong words. You might have taken them out of spiritual leadership at the church. And they've been an elder for 25 years. And you say, well, it's time for new blood. And they can't, they won't forget it. And they won't forgive it. And they want your demise because now you're the first elder. And they used to be the first elder. These are contaminants. Once again, when we are involved with contaminants and try to change their mind, what happens is that we neglect the people that we can actually help. We neglect the people that we actually love the most. I had a friend tell me this story. He said, I was... I have a contaminant in my congregation. And I was in my bed with my wife trying to get romantic. And I, in my mind, the, 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 the face of this person, the words of this person, I, they could not leave my mind. Like You're in bed with your, with your wife about to make love and you're thinking about a contaminant. How crazy is that? Why are you allowing to live in your mind rent free? Why do you give them space? Right? Put on an eviction notice. So you know, you can do what you can hit me if you want over there in your space, but I have a job to do. God has called me to do it. All right. So those are the seven. Here's uh, um, five ways that you can figure out if you right now have an emotional and relational deficit. There are five ways you need to you can know. Number one, you start giving 
$1,000 answers to $10 questions. That's how you know you are in a relational deficit. When somebody says, hey, honey, can you throw out the trash? And you're like, what? Throw out the trash? Don't you know the day that I've had? How can you even ask me about that? Are you even going to ask me what kind of day I've had? I've had the worst day in the world. This is so outrageous. You're so inconsiderate. Why would you tell me to do this? All you said was, can you take out the trash? In good days, when you are not emotionally depleted, you'll say, sure, honey, I'll take it out. Or, yeah, I'll do that in a bit. But today, you're emotionally depleted because every th- everybody's wanting stuff from you, right? And you haven't replenished. You've given them, given and 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 you haven't received anything. So now you think, like, I come home and I and I and I want to have have a space where I'm comfortable and and I'm and I'm in peace. And now I come home and more people want stuff from me. This is what happens when you're in an emotional deficit, when you're in a relational deficit. You start being sarcastic with the people you love the most. You start being aggressive with the people you love the most. And the people you love the most get the least of you. Now, how is that fair to them, though? How? Because God asks you to minister first to the people in your family. How do you know you're in a relational deficit? You start giving $10,000 answers to $10 questions. Number two, you feel you're without options. There's, there's very few worse feelings than feeling that you have no options. Like, I, I'm trapped in this church. I'm trapped in this relationship. I'm trapped with this person. I'm trapped at this job. Like, my, my, my boss is not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I hate going to work. It's a toxic atmosphere. But I can't quit my job right now. And they're not going to quit their job right now. You feel trapped, right? And this trap feeling makes you anxious and makes you irritable once again it affects you with the relationship of people you love the most you feel trapped you feel that you have no options life is better with options number three you feel used the people don't care about how i feel today they don't care that i'm on my period they don't care that i have have headaches and migraines they don't care that i haven't you know, exercise all week because I've been running around. They don't care that it's my day off. They still call me on my day off. They don't care that I'm going through issues in my own relationships, right? They they only want me to help them. And you feel used, right? If you feel used and you start growing resentment about towards the same people that you're supposed to be helping, you start growing resentful, right? You you experience something I call heart shrinkage, but you start resenting the people you're supposed to be helping because you feel used. You're in emotional deficit. Number four, you become cynical. A cynic is a di- disappointed optimist. I always say that. A cynic is a disappointed optimist. You, you scratch before below the surface of a, of a cynic, and you will find somebody who's, who used to be an optimist. Like When you first got into ministry, when you first became a leader in the church, when you first started in this journey you were excited you could change the world god and you could do anything but something happened along the way people disappointed you you love people and they didn't change you try to help people and they talked about you 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 try you gave the best counsel you could and people went off on social media and said like ah don't listen to that person he gave me a terrible counsel and all you did was neglect your own family to go listen to somebody for three hours in a Starbucks, then they go out of there and they say, this is the craziest thing, don't listen to this person, he's a really bad person. And you start becoming cynical. You think to yourself, I know how this story ends. You help people and they betray you. And you start becoming cynical. You you start becoming cynical towards a denomination. They don't care about my family. They don't care about me. They don't get, over there in the conference office, over there in the denominational office, the denomination don't care about me. They don't care about what I'm going through, you start becoming cynical, right? And there's, there are very few cynical lead, leaders that are worth following. If you're a follower, right, think about cynical leaders. Are they inspirational? Do you want to go, you know, you know, do you want to go through a wall uh, to follow them? No, you don't. You're like, man, let me get, get me as far away from this person. Some of you have become so cynical and you don't even notice it. Somebody, somebody, God is talking to somebody right now. 
God is talking to somebody right now because you know lately you become super sarcastic, super cynical. Yeah, yeah, right. Like they care about you. Like every comment about the conference, every comment about your pastor, every comment about other leaders is negative. You become cynical. And number five, this is another way that you know you're you're in a, in a, in a relational deficit. You become anti-change. It's hard to change because... It's, it's hard to change, period. But it's harder to change when you're a relational deficit because you're like, change involves me getting more involved and I don't want to get more involved. Like, I'm already to the max. And change involves me doing something outside my, my comfort zone. In my comfort zone, I'm already overextended. So why would I want to add more stuff? So what happens is that relational deficit kills your creativity. It's hard to be cynical and creative at the same time. It's hard to be tired and creative at the same time. You, you start becoming anti-change. You're like, man, I'm not even going to practice this week with the music team and the praise team and talking to the praise leaders right now. I'm just gonna, we're just going to sing the same songs we sang last week, right? We're just going to keep uh, another week. You know what we practiced last week? Let's not practice again. When people stop practicing, you know they're, they're overextended. When people start giving their best and they're just like, I'm just going to mail it in. Because, you know, sometimes because we have enough talent, we can mail it in. Like you didn't really study for that message, but you have enough communication skills that you can, you can preach a passable message, but you didn't really give your best. If, if you were to be completely honest and transparent, you, would not, you did not give your, your level best. Right, but 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 you couldn't you couldn't change that. You feel like you're trapped. You feel like you don't have options. You feel you're used. You feel you're cynical, and then you don't want to change. You want things to remain the same, and you don't be you're not creative. And what happens with people who are not creative? They're left behind and they become irrelevant. Hate me, or love me, but don't call me irrelevant. That for me, that's the worst <laughs> insult you can give me. Like if you say, I really hate what you're doing or I really love what you're doing, I'll take any, any, any one of those because it means at least I'm doing something. But when you tell me you're irrelevant, I'm not, I don't even know what you're saying. I don't even watch you. I don't even, I'm not even aware of what's going on. When you become irrelevant, there is when you need to be scared. There is where you, that's where you need to be concerned. Now, let me finish by giving you some encouragement. Maybe as you've listened to me, because I, I, what I've done in this message, I'm just trying to diagnose a problem. So what's the solution, Pastor? What is the solution? What do you do? Let me finish by giving you a couple of solutions. Number one, calendarize everything. Calendarize everything. If you don't put date nights, they won't happen. If you don't put like this time for reflection, don't leave slots open in your calendar because if you don't if you're not intentional about filling those slots other people will fill them for you put time of reflection in your calendar put time of uh, rest in your calendar put times of reading in your calendar put times of date nights in your calendar put that times for coaches for comrades for this is this is a time that i have that i'm going to spend with my friend i'm going to go visit my friend and we're just going to hang out we're not going to talk about anything about that has to do about work we're just going to go and play golf calendarize 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 the reason why you're overextended is because you put a few important things in your calendar and you leave a lot of space open and eventually <laughs> inevitable inevitably you're going to have people filling those Spot that is open because when somebody comes to you and says, man, I have a crisis, and you look at your calendar, you don't have nothing there, then you're like, okay, I'm going to slot you in here. But if you had something there, you're like, hey, I can't see you until tomorrow night. I can't see you right now because I have time. You understand that self-care is not selfish. Some of you feel very guilty when you're not doing anything. And you have to understand that rest it's not a reward. We don't rest from work. We rest to work. That's the biblical model. Rest is not a reward. Rest is not like, well, I've, I've overextended myself. Now I can reward myself with rest. That's not the way rest was intended. All right? So calendarize. Make sure. Uh, I divide my day into three. 
8 to 12, 1 to 5, and 6 to 9. Right? That's the way I divide my day. Two of those I work. Right? If you're in full-time ministry, it's a good model to follow. Two of those I work. And one is for me. Like I watch a game. I go out with my spouse. I play golf. I play baseball. I go running. I exercise. I do errands in one of those slots. The other two I work. So if I worked in the morning and I worked in the afternoon, the evening is for me. If I worked in the morning and the evening, the afternoon is for free. It's easy and very tempting to just go, because if you love what you do, it doesn't seem like work. But you have to be intentional about calendarizing, about set the time apart, about dividing your day in this way. And remember, God created you for more. And God created you as a leader to have an impact. And if you're not intentional about having an impact, if you're not intentional about having an impact, people are not going to be able to grow and bless. And whatever you lead is going to become stagnant. So this is the day to change. I want to pray for you so God will help you make that step. Reach out. Once again, if you have any questions, you can reach out on my YouTube channel. You can reach out to me. And you know, I've written several books, English and Spanish. You can access them there. My website is rogerhernandez.org. That, that's the way that you can contact me. I want to help you when I have a conversation sometime. I want to help you. I want to bless you. But for now, let me pray for you. So relational deficit is a thing of the past. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing with this group. We ask that you will allow us to be intentional about calendarizing and look and analyze our relationships as they stand right now and understand where the deficits are. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.